Hey everyone. So uh, we are going to begin here in just a moment. I see uh, we have John on. I think Stu is over there with him as well. So I'll say hello to both. And um, hello to everyone else. If, if you're signed in, uh, go ahead and say hello. Uh, if not, no worries. And um, you know we're glad that you're able to join us. So. We are tying the elk hair caddis tonight. Um, you, of course, you can tie it as a deer hair caddis if you want. It doesn't have to be tied with elk hair. Uh, in fact, this one on the vise right now was tied with deer hair. Um, but I do have elk hair. Uh, we will tie one tonight using the, um, the, the proper material, if you will. And um, the only other thing that we need is just dubbing and uh, some hackle and then some thread. And if you don't have dry fly hackle, don't worry about it. Um, you know, that, that itself is even optional, but uh, it does help it to, to float even more. So, uh, all right. <clears throat> so Jeff has let me know that my mic is coming in really quiet. So uh, is this any better, Jeff? Given a long pause just to see. I'll, I'll, I'll um, need to figure out what's going on on my end. For whatever reason, my mic is is really quiet. Hmm. All right, let me double check something, guys. And do, 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 do. I'm gonna increase the volume. And so hopefully that will make a difference. All right. Um, so Jeff, I'm gonna give uh, one more mic check. Just let me know if that's better. One more mic check. Uh, sorry everyone, there's a little bit of delay from when I actually speak and when you guys hear me. So there'll be a little bit of a brief pause. All right. John's telling me it's looking good. Um, getting text on my phone telling me it's better. Cool. So we do a little bit of things uh, on the fly, right? We, we figure it out every week as we go through and we try different equipment and we try different uh, settings and so on and so forth. So thanks for hanging in there with us. All right. Um, so we're going to go back over because I don't know how quiet it was. You may or may not have heard. Uh, this is a pretty simple pattern. So it's an elk hair caddis, uh, but you can tie it with deer hair. In fact, this one here is tied with deer hair. Uh, so if you want to call it a deer hair caddis, that's fine. I do have elk hair, so we will um, tie it using the, the correct materials uh, when we do it the first time, but you know, deer hair works just fine. Um, the body has some dubbing material on it, and then obviously we have some hackle. Uh, but the hackle itself is, is optional. It's not something that, you know, if you don't have good dry fly hackle and you don't want to put it in there, don't worry about it. Uh, but, um, but yeah, the, the main thing is making sure that you have this nice, it's high visibility, high floating fly, uh, great for our brook trout and the steps involved in tying this particular dry fly. There's only two steps removed from tying a simulator, which is my favorite dry fly period. Oh, I see uh, Jonathan Knox has joined us. Hey John. So the two steps that are missing for a stimulator is a tail and then putting hackle on the front. So, um, so John Golder's asking, uh, what size is this fly? This is a size 10. This is a standard dry fly hook in size 10. You can tie these as big or as small as what you would like. Um, typically, we're gonna see these tied anywhere from you know, on the largest side, maybe a size six, um, all the way down to maybe a size 18. Uh, but typically, you're gonna find these tied in like the 10 through 14, 16 range. Um, you know, just because it's it, visible, high floating, and, and matches more closely a, a caddis fly. Um, this is a caddis dry fly too because it does not have a tail. So if you remember when Jeff was talking about insect identification, he talked about caddis not having any tail, so our dry flies accordingly don't have a tail. And does it matter? I don't actually think so. If you want to tie this with a tail, go ahead. Like I said, a stimulator just has a tail and some hackle in the front. And we might even go over that tonight um, just depending, because this, this fly does not take a long time to tie. So let me go ahead and, and start going over those materials again, and you can kind of see them. So I'm using a standard dry fly hook. My dry flies are, are these particular ones I get from an Orvis shop, but 
any dry fly hook is going to work just fine. Uh, the thing about it is, is it's a, um, oh, that's the wrong one. That's a stimulator hook. Uh, if you want to tie this as a stimulator, it has a little bit of a bend. So ignore that. So that's a better hook. Um, that's a dry fly hook in a size 10. The difference actually between these two, I'll hold them up side by side, is this hook here has a slight bend versus our dry fly is a straight shank. So our caddis fly, um, we're gonna put on the straight and something like a stimulator will actually put on a bit of a bend just to give it in that body. Does it matter that much? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Um, but I know that's how, how I've always been taught the time. Uh, for our dubbing, again, I like the multi-dubbing packs. You can see here, lots of different colors. Tonight, uh, we're kind of gonna start with some, some like dark tan um, coloration. You know, we might even tie, uh, I have like a cinnamon caddis. Maybe I'll tie on that tonight, just because it's gonna match my hackle really, really well, starting off. So, um, yes, you're right, Jonathan. Jonathan talked about the, uh, the eye. So this is, we're gonna go back, this is um, our dry fly hook. So that eye is bent downward on our dry fly hook. So, uh, versus our, this is technically a nymph hook that we use for a stimulator, and that's a straight eye. So let me, let me switch over, and um, yeah, even Jeff's saying he ties a lot of his stimulies on uh, simulators on straight shank hooks. So a downturned eye, what that does is when you go to set the hook, part of the theory at least, is that it will provide more leverage to turn this hook. Uh, you'll see that a lot on dry flies because that supposedly helps with the hookup ratio as the, the fish come up to hit it uh, versus a nymph hook, which is straight shank. And I have, I, I have all, or, or maybe it'll, um, if it's weight down, something like this. Uh, let's see here. Oh, looks like I'm having some technical issues, guys. All right, that looks like it's coming back. Sorry, I was showing you a straight eye. I'm not sure where that cut out. Um, but uh, so a straight eye, typically on a nymph, it's gonna be either vertical or it'll be down. And so you don't necessarily need that curve in order to set that hook. That's my theory that I've heard. Um, Jeff in the comments can let you guys know if there's any other advantage to a straight eye versus a, a downturned eye. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've never noticed the difference when I fished. So, all right, um, so the last materials, uh, there, there's two that we didn't go over. Um, so we, we went over dubbing, uh, we went over hooks. Um, the last is uh, hair, right? So. This is elk hair, and I also have some deer hair as well. Now there's some really good, uh, really, really good tutorials and videos on YouTube. Uh, there's a guy, Kelly Gallup out west, who does these phenomenal YouTube videos on just selecting deer hair. So if you go into a fly shop, honestly, I don't go into a fly shop anymore um, just because, hey, asthmatic. Uh, but when I did, I would go in uh, and it would actually, you can look at different packs of hair and try to figure out what's supposedly better versus not. And one of the things that you look at is, I'll, I'll pull this pack out, is the delineation in coloration. So as you come up the hair, see how it changes to this darker color and then it goes up to this, this top kind of color? The straighter across that patch that line is and kind of the tighter that gradient, Supposedly, the better it is to tie, and he, he does a lot of uh, phenomenal kind of deer hair patterns. Um, the other thing that you look at, and I'll get really close here, well, it's not gonna focus. I'm gonna switch to the other camera just so you can get a better view. Is when you look at the hair itself, you look at the shaft, and how crinkly or straight it is, is also gonna affect and how it ties. So if it's really, really wavy, really, really crinkly, that's gonna make it harder to get these nice straight wings, but it can be good for other types of patterns. Um, versus a straighter shank like this will give us you know, the, these straighter wings. So now elk hair, 
is there is a difference between elk hair and deer hair. You can see uh, our elk hair is a lot thicker. It, so it it's, uh, actually will float better. Uh, and it is also a lot longer typically than deer hair, although that's not always true. It depends on, on when the deer was, um, was harvested. So, all right. So that's a little bit of the tutorial on the deer hair. Jeff, that might be uh, a fun thing to, to put up on our, our Facebook page, um, kind of looking at deer hair and selecting deer hair. And the last thing I wanna go over is hackle. And we've gone over this a few times, but I always recommend, if you really get into tie and dries, get yourself kind of a multi-pack like this. Um, they're gonna cost obviously more than just uh, a regular uh, pack, but you know, you're gonna get lots of different sizes um, depending on, on where in this these kind of like half hackle capes uh, that you can get uh, for, for different size dry flies, right? So I can tie very small dries and very large flies all from these. And I've got four different colors to choose from. By the way, I'm gonna be tying with this more ginger color uh, tonight. Uh, again, just for reference, if you know, hey, I'm gonna be tying with um, size tens. You know, in this case, I've got size 16, um, but you know, they make them in all the different hook sizes. And you say, I like size 10, I can see size 10, the fish seem to like size 10, that's what I wanna tie with. Just get yourself a pack of 100, it's designed to, to be able to tie somewhere around 100 flies and um, save yourself a couple of bucks. And you can just get those in the individual colors that you want. So there's two different ways to go about it. I do like the introductory hackle packs because to me, you just get a lot more value. Um, but that's up to up to you guys. Only if you really get into tying dries, would I say make that kind of investment. All right, uh, so let's get into it. Let's let's actually have some fun. Oh, and um, you know, I, as always with thread, I try to match generally the color that I'm going to be using for the dubbing. But honestly, you could just go with white. You go with black. You go with red. Uh, those are three colors that, that work for like everything. White's great because you've got a sharpie. You can color it at the very end. Um, black tends to blend in with everything except for very, very light colored flies. And then red gives an accent. So you could call it a, um, a royal fly if you want, right? Uh, not quite the same thing. We'll tie a royal wolf eventually. A royal wolf. I have one of those. Uh, give me one second. I'll, I'll throw it up on the, on the camera. So you guys can see what I mean. A royal wolf um, specifically refers to a fly that has like a royal hot spot, that red band kind of in the center. So you'll see a couple different types of dries tied in a royal style. And they just mean they have that hot spot. We'll, uh, we'll, if you guys are interested, we'll, we'll tie something like this. It's a, a split wing, it's a, a much more um, challenging dry but it's, uh, I think, fun to tie and extremely effective on the stream. So, you know, let me know. I mean, we do these for you guys. Uh, if that's something you guys want to see one time, give me a heads up and we can tie it. So, let's pull this finish caddis off the vise, throw on a hook, and get started. So, hook in the vise. Um, just just enough pressure that I can bend down the hook, but not so much pressure on the vise. This depends. Um, certain vices, you don't change the pressure. This particular vise, you can. If you really start crushing down um, and really crank down on, um, oh, you can't see it on this. Sorry, guys. Um, but uh, there's a little camshaft lever that you, you pull over. If you really start clamping down, you can actually mess with the integrity of the hook especially on these smaller hooks. So all I'm doing is enough that I know that that hook shank will bend a little bit under pressure and I know it's good enough and it's set in the vise. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start putting my thread on, right? So this is no different than all the other times that we've done this. We're gonna start up at the front, we're gonna layer thread base going all the way back to where that barb of the hook used to be. Um, if you're using a barbless hook, you can kind of just go back to where a barb probably would have been. I already have debarbed this hook, as you can see. So I'll cut my excess thread off before I get to my finished tie-in point, and then just lay that thread right back. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out, let me switch the camera. So we're gonna be tying with 
deer hair. Now deer hair flares under pressure. That pressure is going to be applied from our thread. So it's thread tension is so critical to these types of flies. So my bobbin, now obviously I have one that has adjustable tension. Um, it's just my, my preference, but standard regular bobbins, you know, will also have pressure as well. So this type of bobbin has pressure applied um, just by, by this wire. So when I take off this bobbin, you can see that obviously the bobbin is wider than these two points. So based upon how far in or out these are with, when they're not under tension, will determine how much tension is applied to our bobbin. So if I wanna adjust that, I just need to bend that out. Now I'm not, because this is uh, one that I use for tying up uh, deer hair bugs for bass, so I like lots of tension on that. Um, but on this type of bobbin, there's a little wheel and you just adjust the tension on that. But I have this tension set where it's only just enough to kind of keep it from just unspooling if I let go. So there's not a lot of thread tension at all on this bobbin. I'm gonna be applying all of my tension today by hanging onto the bobbin with my hands. So you can just barely see that on camera, right? The way that I'm holding this, and I'm using my fingers to apply all the tension I need. Because if I need to, I'll switch, switch cameras. Um, if I need to get more, so let's say I've, I've tied them real close, I need more thread. If this is really taunt, and I go to pull the thread away, I'll end up flaring that hair by accident when we get to that step. Um, so I like to have it real loose so that it doesn't mess with it. So this is um, a fly that is uh, a little bit more delicate in that, that part. So, you know, good tip, good, th good something to be thinking about. I always say material management and thread control are the two things that will advance your fly time the most. Just mastering those will take you so far. All right, um, so what you can do, uh, so we didn't talk, what we've talked a few times now as we've gone through dry flies uh, about selecting a feather, right? So I have a dry fly feather here. And if I wanna gauge it to see if I have uh, the correct size, I just bend it around the hook. And you can see these tips are just the same length as the hook gap. Uh, I like that for this fly. For other dries, um, especially like a parachute, Adams, if you remember, I like to have it where it's maybe as much as one and a half. So between one and one and a half times that the gap, uh, the hook gap. But for the elk hair caddis, stimulators, I typically like something that's only that hook gap in width. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and cut off. You can see on this feather, on this dry fly feather, we have this kind of webby end and that transitions over until we get to a nice even point. And we see that this uh, kind of central um, quill, I think it's what it's called, um, that stem starts to thin out. So I'm actually gonna cut this feather right about there. And that's where I can begin to prepare my dry fly feather, right? And as always, we're going to make our little comb so we spread out our individual barbs and we cut them to make this little comb and that's going to allow that thread to really capture in this feather so we can wrap it better. Now I'm going to give you another really good trick here. I can wrap this in a couple different ways. I can wrap it in where it's just going straight back um, or I could wrap it in where it's at a slight angle. The advantage of doing it this way where it's at a slight angle is when I go to do that first wrap around, part of that bend has already been put in place versus if I wrap it where it's just go straight back, then I actually have to come up and do a 90 degree angle. See how those barbs off the back are sticking straight out versus if I have it where it's closer to vertical and I start to bend, a little hard to see, to see how they're not bending straight out. Um, that's a lot less stress. You'll break less hackle feathers when you go to turn it, and it'll look uh, neater when you finish. So the way that you accomplish this 
do a loose wrap is you kind of have it where that feather is sitting at that angle and then you wrap it in in that way so you know it'll come back a little bit part of it's the weight of the feather part of it is just inevitable as you're wrapping around a horizontal surface but there's still a little bit of that bend in it so that's um, that's our first step is we get our hackle tied in now we're going to do our dubbing noodle so again when i go ahead and i do this on these types of boxes um, and i am going to tie with that cinnamon caddis color tonight um, there's there are holes on these boxes you can take something like your whip finishing tool go in there and you can actually grab out a little tuft that's really hard to see because i'm actually only grabbing a very small amount you can actually hook part of it and that allows you to start pulling out uh, just the amounts that you need now the other thing here is that when we do this um, and i know that uh, we don't have a good angle on this guys but we're going to um, basically we're going to use wax uh, i always just wet my thread i just wet my finger then i wet my thread just to help that thread become a little stickier and we're going to take this wisp and you can see here there's not a lot of dubbing and we're going to lay that right over top of the thread i always wet my uh my two fingers because we're going to be rolling this on that's how we perform our, our dubbing noodle so you can see that i'm going and just rolling my fingers and that's going to end up resulting and i'm going to keep doing this until everything gets wound very nice and tightly around our thread so you can see that that was accomplished by just moving my fingers i guess it's like a cricket is how we'll say um, just opposite directions and forming that w noodle all right so once you've done that then what we're going to do is we're going to start wrapping forward and our goal is to wrap until we get somewhere about maybe an eye length or two eye lengths back right so on this particular hook i'm going to try to wind up somewhere around there if you can notice i've run out of dubbing um, i just have a tiny bit left so i can go back over take another wisp wet my thread place it on i wet my fingers and same motion Right, so always better to have not enough dubbing than too much because you can add more on pretty easily. And now I'm going to continue moving forward. And that looks to be right about where I want to be. So a couple extra wraps and it's in place. I like it, Stu. You tied a cricket in. That's, uh, hey, that's a dry fly. Go ahead and fish it. So I am putting in a half hitch. Now in the last video that Jeff did, he did a half hitch using his scissors. Um, that's like, if you don't have a little half hitch tool, that's actually a great way to do it. The uh, half hitch though is, um, this, is a, this is my bodkin. The other side of my bodkin has a half hitch tool. If you're looking for a bodkin, I always recommend getting one with a built-in half hitch tool because it makes it super easy to go ahead and place that in. Um, but if you don't have one, then you can use that kind of um, trick that, that Jeff showed everyone. Uh, so, all right. I'm gonna take advantage of the rotary vise. Um, just hanging my thread off the, the end. Um, but um, if you put a half hitch in, you can, you can put your um, bobbin down and not have to worry about it coming undone. So. Uh, all right, the next part is I am going to use my handy hackle pliers and I'm going to grab the end of this hackle so that I have that in place. Um, I always do that for a couple of reasons. One, it does make it easier to wrap around, um, less likely to let go. And the other reason is, is it's going to give me weight at the end and you'll see where that becomes important, right? And, and we've done this before. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start 
rotating my vise. If you don't have a rotary vise, you're just wrapping around, palmering around. And that just means where I'm going to take that. Uh, I'll do I'll do a wrap that way. Um, where you're just going to take and very carefully. I don't like doing this because that's why. Um, now you know why I actually rotate the vise and use the rotary function because my hands are going to end up going in front of the, uh, the camera lens. Um, but you can do it that way. We're not looking to make this super, super dense, right? We're doing kind of an open spiral. You want to see that dubbing shine through a little bit. And we're just going to go right up to where our dubbing finished. So somewhere around that point. We don't want to go too far because we don't want to crowd anything, right? So right up about where that dubbing finished. Now, remember I talked about adding weight and with the half applier? I now have let go of my hackle. So, you know, my, my hands are free. And that uh, weight of those hackle pliers is holding my hackle in place. It allows me to breathe a little bit. It's not going to come undone. And I can go ahead and grab my bobbin. I can wind my thread up, adjust that tension if I need to. And then I can go ahead and wrap and, and wrap in that hackle. So that's why I like using that half hitch tool uh, is, is because it really makes this a lot easier. So I'm going to put that wrap behind. I'm going to do it again so you guys can see, because I know I didn't explain when I did it. I put a wrap in front. So in front means in front of this hackle that I'm tying in. So I did a wrap in front. And then I'm going to literally put my thread behind that hackle. And then that's what I call wrap behind. And then I put another wrap in front. You may trap a couple fibers where they, they end up pointing forward. Don't worry about that. It's, it's no big deal. If that happens, there are multiple ways that we can fix that. The important thing is to make sure that you've captured this hackle feather in place so that when you go to cut it off, it doesn't, you know, un unwrap on you. Now, as always, when I go to cut my hackle, I'm going to take my finger. You can see my fingernail here, as dirty as it is. I'm going to push the thread away so that I can come in with my scissors and I can cut off this hackle feather without cutting my thread. All right. So. I told you there's a couple different ways that we can kind of um, fix these hackle feathers coming forward. One of the ways is you can go through and you can actually trim them with a pair of scissors. You just want to make sure they're not sticking out past the eye. Everything else will get covered up in due time. Um, another way is you can do it with a half hitch tool. So I can actually come in with that half hitch tool, kind of push it in, and that'll kind of start pushing them back. Um, or you can actually, if they're long enough, you can grab them and kind of pull them back and then put some wraps in place. I just trim with scissors because it's pretty easy. Um, I'll do this now versus later because it gets a lot harder once we go ahead and uh, put in our hair. So taking just a minute to clean it up as I tie along will, will result in a, a neater looking fly in the end. Um, I'm just gonna put a couple wraps forward and back See, I'm grabbing those hackle fibers, pulling them back so they don't trap anymore. And I go ahead and I, I bring those wraps forward. That just cleans it up. All right, so now we've got a spiky looking fly, right? Lots of hackle fibers. Um, and we are almost ready. Yes, Stu, do not use a lighter for this. That is hilarious, actually. Um, you, you, I'm sure it cleaned it up. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, so you can, at this point, tie in your deer hair. But I, uh, I think you will get a fly that looks a lot nicer if we do another little trimming step right here. So I use a pair of scissors. Um, and I like long scissors for this. These are, are not my normal scissors. Um, yeah, I have an assortment of scissors and I haven't really gone over this in the past. So I have my regular kind of like heavy duty, all duty scissors. This is what I will cut all my hair with. So I can work with bucktail uh, when I go to, to trim the deer hair in a minute. Um, they're always being kind of trimmed with these scissors. 
they're not as sharp anymore as a result, right? Because they're, they're cutting all kinds of different materials. I also have, and you just saw me use these when I trimmed up the hackle, a pair of sharp kind of fine tip scissors, right? These are my precision. These are for when I'm doing dry flies. You know, they come to a very sharp point. Um, they're also very, very sharp. They do not cut uh, more coarse material unless they absolutely have to. So I try to prevent cutting any type of deer hair with that. I also have long scissors, right? So these long scissors are great for doing what we're about to do or if I'm shaping big bass bugs, things like that. Do you need multiple scissors? No, one pair of scissors be just fine. In fact, this is my original pair. When I started tying, still have them and they still work and I could tie everything with them. Uh, just having specific scissors can make things a little bit easier. Totally not required, but you know, if you really get into fly tying, that's why some people have multiple pairs. All right, so these long scissors are great because I can just open them slightly. And what I'm gonna do, and I'll show you, is I'm opening them slightly and I am leaning against the eye of the hook and I'm gonna come back at an angle. Now I'm not cutting the hook, but what I'm gonna do is trim. And I usually do two or three cuts to make sure everything gets trimmed. I have made a little ramp in those hackle fibers. So when I put on the wing, it's gonna actually sit more at that angle. Uh, kind of holds it into place. Kind of a neat trick. I think it makes the fly look a little nicer in the end. Not required, but um, you know, give it a give it a try. All right, so I promised this one we were gonna do correctly. So we're gonna tie with elk hair. And the way that I do this is I will use my bodkin and I will come in and I will just grab a section and pull it away. See that? Right, so I can come in and I'm trying to bending them out. And what that does is it gives me, well, I'll set it against my hair, right, or, or my forehead. It gives me a line of hair that's really easy for me to grab and, and collect together to cut off. That results in, as you go through, and I'll show it on a patch of deer hair. See how that's still nice and really even? So as I cut, I'm working my way up. It keeps this thing from getting to be an absolute mess. Uh, it also allows me to grab, you know, and, and visually measure how much I need, right? So I'm gonna grab about that much off of a line. Now I'll show you more close up against the hook so you kind of understand, okay, this is about how much hair I need. Um, so, you know, I've got a pretty good selection. I'm gonna cut it off. And I always cut as close to the hide as I can. And I'll show you it here. All right, I've got a bundle that kind of looks like that. What I'm looking for is when it's bundled together, maybe it covers a hook gap, right? You know, it's not a, a giant amount. You can see that it's relatively flat, right? Um, and that it'll be plenty long enough. So that's maybe the diameter of a pencil, holding it where it's, it's pinched flat in my fingers. That's about what I'm doing for the size 10. I like to tie them heavy because I like to fish them in fast flowing water, right? Brook trout streams, things like that. You can adjust as you need. Um, it also makes it so it's easier to see on the water. All right. So the other thing, and we've done this before when we've talked about tying with deer hair, is there's a lot of fuzz, right? And you can really see that on this close-up camera. So what I'm gonna do is I'm holding by the tips, holding this bundle of hair, and I'm gonna take my fingers, just kind of pull back. It pulls out any short fibers and a lot of that fuzz. And I'm gonna repeat that until I feel like I've pulled most of the fuzz off. Um, typically you don't do this over top of the fly that you're tying because I just put a whole bunch of fuzz on that fly. Uh, typically you're doing it farther back, uh, which I'm going to do now because I just fuzzed up my fly and I didn't like that. But um, you know, you guys get to see the idea. So now I've got a bundle of hair that's a lot cleaner. See that difference? That's why we go through and we take that time to clean up that fly. So now we got a whole bunch of tips here 
and um, they're not aligned, right? And, and they're kind of at different lengths and that's completely fine. You can 100% go ahead and skip the next step that I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna use a hair stacker and you can tie it in this way. And there is nothing wrong with that. You do not need a hair stacker to tie these types of flies. Uh, with that said, I'm gonna use a hair stacker because it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a vanity thing. I just think it makes it look that much nicer. Gives me a lot of pride in, in the fly and um, you know makes it where I'll wanna fish it more. So how we do this, sorry, I, I, I did not show that on camera. I just did it. Um, let me undo it and hopefully not have to recut in the process. So I have the tips. I have a hair stacker tips into the hair stacker, right? So we're gonna put those tips in first and they'll kind of be sitting out and then I'm gonna bang it on, on the desk. Um, and as I do that, I'm just gonna do it gently. Those will align. So you can kind of hear that tapping, screen shaking, because I'm shaking the whole thing. So yeah, the, the beard brush, um, by the way, I also have an actual hair comb. Um, but beard brushes actually work really, really well. Uh, you can use that to, to get that fluff out super easily. All right, so I've kind of tapped them in place. You can see they're kind of down inside. And I'm, I don't know, I'm weird. I always think this is magical. When you separate the hair stacker, all those tips are nicely aligned. I love that. Um, I don't know, I'm weird, but it's a simple, simple things in life. So I'm gonna grab those by the very, very tips, pull everything out. And then I'm gonna transfer hands so I can start to measure length. And what I'm looking for is where they're about the same length or maybe a little bit longer than the hook shank. And I'm gonna hold them up at an angle because they're gonna be angled. And I'm gonna take my other hand and I'm kind of visually marking that spot. So I've seen elk or caddis tied multiple ways. I've seen people tie it on with these butts out here and then they'll actually bend the butts back and they'll trim them. Or um, the way I like to do it is to trim them right now and then I'll tie them in and then um, if I need any extra trimming, I, I will. So I'm gonna do this fly. I'm gonna tie at least two tonight. Um, the next one's gonna be a lot faster, I promise. Uh, I'm gonna cut this one for this fly and the next one I'll show you if you don't cut it, how you can do it as well. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and I'm kind of marking. Remember, I've, I've got the tips sitting out the back of my fingers at about the length I want, and then I'm gonna go ahead and cut that. Which is where I make a mess on my bench, just so you guys can see. So I'm gonna go ahead now, and I've got all those butts lined up. You can see how it's going straight up vertical. So what I'm gonna do, and this is that part where that thread tension is so critical to make sure it's not super tight. I'm gonna put this first wrap up and I'm gonna have it real loose across this, these butts. So let me go back, because by showing you, I'm going so slowly, I ended up tracking some hackle. So I'm gonna go back in and I'm doing it real loose I'm actually gonna pinch the thread with my fingers. So I pinch the thread, do that again, pinch it, bring it down, get it where that thread goes underneath, and I'm gonna start pulling up just enough so those butts start getting pulled down. Go back down, pinch, pull up. With a little bit more pressure, come back down, come up. With a little bit more pressure, never letting go of those hackle five or um, sorry of the elk hair and also never putting any pressure on the downstroke so you see right now how that hook is moving it's because I'm pulling down instead I want it coming up this is going to help prevent this hair from rolling four five maybe a half a dozen turns and then I'm just going to put a turn or two in front just to help lock those threads in place so I can let go and start examining. What I'm looking for here is a couple of things. One, I'm checking to see whether or not my hair rolled. So it's always going to move a little on you, but you can see I did a, I did a pretty good job here, right? 
things are, are on top of the hook. If they're not, grab it and twist. That'll help move that bundle. I haven't put enough thread wraps in that it's super, super locked in, right? Um, you know, another thing that you can do is if you need to, if everything is real tight, you can come back in with your finger and you can kind of flatten it out a little bit too if you need to, right? Um, so you can adjust right now. After you kind of have it adjusted where you want, then you can come back in and put another wrap or two in front of that bundle. You can come back, still hang on to your hair, and you can put in another couple of tight wraps. Again, pulling, pulling on that upstroke. After you've done that, I like to actually put wrap or two in front, and I like to just start kind of wrapping into that, that front bundle, really helping to grab that hair, really helping to, to hold all of that in place, right? Uh, and at that point, we're, we're kind of ready to finish the fly. If, you know, you don't have to go through here and really finish this up. I don't even worry about it. Because all that is is just extra kind of flotation, right? So I'm gonna put maybe three, four wraps in front. And the reason those wraps go in front is if I let go of the thread, the tension isn't directly onto the hair bundle, it, it's on the um, hook itself, less likely to start rolling it. And now I'm ready to finish the fly off. You can do that with half hitches. So again, we take our half hitch tool, we just kind of wrap around that tool and put a series of half hitches in. That's easy enough to do. Or we can finish with a whip finish tool, right? And, um, you know, you guys let us know. If you want to see a, a tutorial just on using like a half, you know, half hitch uh, or a um, or a whip finish and, and see those, let us know and we can kind of make a video just around that. Um, but I'm going to put in two, two kind of four whip turns. And, you know, I really don't think this fly is going to come apart. You know, if I wanted to, I could also put in a drop of super glue um, just to, to really lock it in there if I wanted to. But, you know, that, that's totally optional, not required. And that's it. That's a uh, that's an elk hair caddis. A fantastic dry fly catches everything. You know, you can go out and catch bass on this. You know, no problem. You can catch trout all over all over the world on this fly. Right. Super easy. Uh, very, very high floating. You know, we'll float all day. Uh, you can mess with the coloration, right? So we tied ours a little darker today. Um, don't have to. You can tie it super light, whatever color you want. If you want to tie it purple or pink, have at it. Believe it or not, that'll probably work. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, and um, that's all there is to it. So I'm going to tie up another one a little faster so you can see it. And then I'm going to, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling after that. We may even go in and tie a stimulator. Uh, you guys let me know if you want to go and have a long night tonight or not. Uh, I'm fine with it. But um, if you want to have a short night, then we can just tie one more and, and, and call it a day. You guys give me some feedback. Let me know what you're you're looking to do. So we're going to put in another hook, making sure there's just enough tension that bends it. Uh, I'm going to tie this one with deer hair, not with elk. Um, just so you can see that, that kind of difference. And... Um, Go ahead and tie this in. It's the same thing. We, we're going to do our thread base from the front all the way to the back. I'm going to cut off about halfway. And keep going. Like that. Bringing that thread right back to where that, that barb, that hook used to be. That's kind of our, our back tie in point. And I think, yeah. So one of the nice things about that hackle feather that I used earlier, it's actually still plenty long enough that I can use it again for this fly. So I can get two flies out of um, that one feather, just long enough. So again, I've, I've cut in that little comb. You guys saw me do that last time. Tie it in at an angle just to make it a little easier when we go to wrap around. I didn't do as good of a job that time, but it's good enough. Bring my thread back so I can make my dubbing noodle. I'm going to use that same cinnamon brown because I actually really like this. These, uh, these flies are looking nice. I am going to put them into my fly locks and fish them uh, probably sometime this month.
um, or December, I should say, not because we're still in November when this is being recorded. Uh, but December, I'm going to start fishing for brook trout again, and you can believe that these will be some of the flies that I'm going to tie. Right, so I put in my dubbing noodle. I'm going to start working that forward. And I am trying to make sure that it's it's relatively even when I wrap, right? So you can see here there's, there's not a lot left. I'm going to wait uh, to wrap anymore until I can get some more uh, dubbing. More dubbing dubbed around my thread. Let's do that. You know, when you connect the two together, you're always going to have kind of like a sparse section. So to compensate for that, I'll put a couple extra wraps in the same spot so before I move forward, and that kind of keeps it relatively even. Um, so that should be just enough. And so we're good. I'm going to go ahead, put in that half hitch in place. And we'll go ahead and, and get ready to uh, to put on our hack, to palmer it around the bend of the hook. So, um, U.S. Army Guardsman, you said that you think you did fine with yours. Fantastic. Uh, you know, seriously, it, it you know there there are some hard steps in here, and yeah, we'd love to see love to see pictures. Um, you know, this is you master this fly. It's a simple fly, but if you master it. This, the, the steps are there for tying far more complex dry flies. So, you know, congratulations, fantastic, and, and I'd say keep going, keep having at it. So again, we're, we're putting kind of a loose spiral on. We don't need to have it super tight. We'll put it right up to where we kind of stopped our, our dubbing. And I'll stop it there. I kind of make sure those fibers get stroked back a bit. That'll help me a little bit. Do a little bit better job and hopefully I won't capture as many as I did last time. Put a couple wraps down before I go ahead and, and, and put a wrap behind that material. Put a wrap in front, maybe two wraps in front, a wrap behind, a wrap in front or two. I like to do it at least twice, making sure that I've got it captured. Go ahead and push my thread out of the way. I'll come back. Trim these fibers right now because I always trap some. I'm sure someone out there will, will see this video and be like, oh, well, he should have done this step or that step to prevent trapping. Leave a comment. Let us know. You know, we're, hey, I'm still learning. But um, I find that I can just trim afterwards and, and it'll work just fine. So I'm going to get my thread in place. And by in place, I mean right in front of where I stopped wrapping my hackle. Come back in with my long scissors and occasionally I'll just come back in and, and kind of brush back the hackle fibers. It kind of gets them where they're in line uh, when I go to trim to make sure I don't miss any. Trim them at an angle. And now I'm ready to go ahead and put in my deer hair. So I'm going to use, I've got this nice kind of gingery, simony um, stimulator deer hair is what it's called. It's just deer hair. And so again, Taking that pack, taking my bodkin, just kind of working that in and pulling out a very thin line of hair. They make clips for this. Um, there's like a CDC clip or something like that. I might have that wrong. Um, they're usually uh, made overseas, you know, in um, like the European shops will carry them more to actually go through and, and grab a line. But I, I found that I can just do the same thing with my bodkin, get that kind of line of, uh, of deer hair. And then I can just kind of grab that and, and cut it right off. Um, and that works well enough for me. But, um, you know, there is a tool out there to make that easier. So, after getting that bundle, let me switch over. You got that bundle. Uh, I got lots of, of mess, right? So it's just simply a matter of kind of pulling all that, that mess out. Occasionally you'll want to grab from the front, do it again. Uh, we mentioned about that beard comb. So if you actually go in with the comb, it'll really pull out. Let me do this a few times. It really does help to pull out some of that, that mess. 
Works really well for tying bass bugs. Um, typically, I find it's not necessary for doing these um, dry flies, just because there's you know just not as much hair as when I've got a, a giant bundle for for doing bass. All right, so switch back. Take my hair stacker tips in first. And I'm gonna go ahead and start tapping it on the table. And I'm not banging super hard. It's just enough so that things uh, jostle. And that's what places them in into position in the line step. All right, so I'm not banging super, super hard. Just, just enough so that when I separate, everything is aligned nice and conveniently. And as always, every time after I, I, I do that stacking, I've got them by the tips, I'll actually grab them again and pull out any more kind of shorts um, and kind of uh, weird bits because that can, that can help loosen up some of that as well. The other thing that I'll do is I'll actually, when I go to transfer now, I'll grab towards the back and then I'll pull out because there'll be a couple of shorts in there as well. It really helps clean everything up, make it more uniform. Just makes the fly look nice. So again, I'm gonna have those tips where they're kind of coming right back behind the bend of the hook, doing it at an angle when I do it. Then I'm gonna grab this bundle. And I promise you this time, I'm gonna do it where everything is, is going forward, right? Um, so same trick. It's a little bit easier. So I actually started with the hard way first. And I'm gonna start pulling on the upstroke. You notice how that hair, hair is not moving. Hair is not moving, hair starts to move. It's because I'm only putting tension on the upstroke. Three, four, see now it's starting to flare because I'm putting successive tension. No one wrap has enough tension to secure this, but it's only after doing four, five, six turns with more and more pressure that I will start getting this hair in place. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this bundle with my fingers and kind of move it back to expose that hook eye before I put maybe three, four wraps in. So I put about six turns around the bundle and maybe about three or four in front. Every turn with more and more pressure, right? So now I've got, I don't know, that looks like a rock star or something, right? Maybe an 80s rock star of that hair flared. So I can come in with my scissors and you're going to want to be careful. So I'm going to grab this part of the hair and I'm going to pull that down just to expose those butt ends. And the nice thing is they're pretty visually distinctive. And so now I'm going to come in at an angle. So see how I'm coming at an angle? I'll show you with the scissors closed. I'm going to kind of rest my scissors on this hook eye. And I'm going to point them up. And you may have to do this once or twice. And I'm gonna start trimming. All right? I'm gonna start trimming back just a bit. Because I can never get all of them in one go. Especially with these scissors. These scissors are really getting dull. Those are my general all purpose. So let me switch to the long pair because they're actually a lot sharper. Still kind of holding those butt ends or tip ends back. You can go ahead and you can clean this up. So that's the other way to kind of secure it, right? So I, I've trimmed those butt ends now. Um, I may have missed one or two. I did. I, I will get those. Not the end of the world. If they're actually hanging back there, they're not going to hurt anything. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting in some wraps in between those butts. Hence. And working my way back. Still making sure most of my tension goes on that upturn and I'm gonna kind of work my way back forward. So I'll be honest, when you tie it this way, what you end up doing, if you don't split your, your thread around the hook eye, is um, you actually can secure this bundle a whole lot easier. That's why I tied it the second time this way because by being able to put those wraps forward and back like that, I've actually uh, trapped multiple ways, this bundle. It doesn't make as clean of a look, um, but it will secure uh, this, uh, this material in that much better. So at this point, we are ready uh, to actually go ahead and, and finish off the fly and put in some half hitches. 
right? So super, super simple. You can see how you can tie up a dozen of these in no time, right? There's a three turn and I'll do a four turn just to make sure this thing is, is you know, nice and uh, through three, four locked in. And go ahead and trim my thread. So yeah, those scissors are really good and all. All right, um, so let me grab the one that we did with elk hair and then I'll, I'll put it out to the one that we just tied with uh, with deer hair and you can see a little bit of a difference. You'll see a difference in the hair um, and you'll see a difference in how we finish the fly, right? This one, the, the head of that fly is a lot cleaner uh, than, than the one we just did. Um, but they both are super fishy, um, super nice, right, I think. And, and we'll certainly catch fish all day long. So either way works. Um, the way that I just showed you is uh, much easier, obviously, because you don't have to be as precise. But um, give it a go. I, I recommend you try both ways and um, see, how, see how it works out for you. So give me a thumbs up or not if uh, you want to see a stimulator tied really quickly. You know, let me know in the chat and um, give me the heads up because I don't mind tying one. That way you see what steps are different. You know, because uh, honestly, we are very, very close with this fly to a stimulator. All right, I got to vote for yes. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to switch hooks just because I like tying on a curved hook, but you do not have to switch hooks. You 100% can tie this on a straight shank hook. In fact, you heard Jeff, Jeff prefers to tie using a straight shank hook, or at least he ties most of them on. I don't know if he prefers or not. He might say, no, I don't prefer, but um, if I'm gonna tie on a slightly curved hook, you'll see that when it goes on the vise. Right, see how that has a slight bend to it? Now, when I tie stimulators on a hook that has a bit of a bend, I will position this hook so that the eye of the hook is level. So back here is not level, right? That's sloping down. I do that when I go to finish, it makes it a lot easier. You'll, you'll see when I get there. And I'm gonna tie this guys relatively quickly, but I will go slower on the sections that are new. So everything we uh, have used, all the materials are exactly the same. The only thing that could be different is your hook. You can use the exact same hook. So literally you have, if you've been tying along, everything in front of you is what you need to tie a stimulator. So we're gonna do the exact same thing. We are going to lay a thread base from the eye of the hook back to the bend. Now this is a curved hook. So it's a little bit different, um, you know, in, in, in where we'll kind of finish. Because typically on a straight hook, we go until we get to the bend of the hook and then we stop. So this time we're actually going to start wrapping down a bend. A little bit different, right? But we're still aiming for that point kind of where that uh, barb is, right? So that's about this, this spot on the hook. So that's where we're going to stop. But you can see I've wrapped down a bend a bit. So just a little bit of a difference in this. Um, but for me, most of my visual markers uh, for tying a fly is that section where that barb is. Some people will only tie to the hook point. Uh, just your preference. So this is just how I, I learned to tie. All right. So the next part about this is, is we're going to grab a small section of deer hair. We're going to stick with deer for this. So you can see I'm not not nearly as much, right? When I was tying that elk hair caddis for the wing, I was maybe pulling that much off. I'm only pulling, I don't know, maybe a dozen fibers, maybe more. Might be a dozen and a half. And that's going to be our tail material. So let me go ahead and grab that. Right, same thing, getting that fuzz out. 
doing the fuzz, as much of the fuzz as I can. I've got a, a guard here. So there's one. Oh, that's going to be really hard to see. Yeah, let me get in focus. There's one that's really long. You can actually pull that one out too. Um, that's my preference. So tips in first into the hair stacker. Couple taps. Nice and aligned. And this is going to be what we use to tie in our tail. Now the tail for the stimulator does not need to be that long. It's actually kind of short. It's a little short stubby tail. So I don't know, let's, let's give you a visual marker. Maybe say half the length of the hook shank, maybe less, right? Just enough so that there's an indication of a tail. So I'm gonna stick that out. It usually sticks a little bit past the, the end of the hook. I'm gonna kind of grab that and then I'm gonna start cinching that into place. And again, not putting any pressure on that downstroke. It's all on the upstroke, a couple successive turns, but not a lot of pressure at all at the moment. So you can see I'm tying actually pretty loose. The reason for that is I don't want this tail to flare. If I were to put tight wraps in the back, that tail will poof out. And I don't want that. I want those to stay together. So I put a couple wraps in and started coming up the shank of this hook. Um, one, this is going to give me the body of that hook uh, and make it a little bit thicker. And then the other thing is, is that it's going to prevent me from accidentally flaring the back of that. So I'm just putting a bunch of loose wraps in, moving my way up that hook, kind of spiral wraps as well, right? And I'm going to get up to about this point. And I'm going to pull this hair back, put a couple wraps in front of it. It almost looks like a parachute post. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not going to be a parachute and I'm going to clip that off and now I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll clean up this. And this is where I can put in a lot of pressure, really make sure that that's being secured and that ensures that this is actually tied into place. It doesn't need to be perfectly trapped and I'm going to do kind of that open spiral backwards back to that tail. So I'm um, still going to be really cautious back here because I don't want to put a lot of pressure because I want to keep that material from flaring. So if I were to, I'll show you, if I were to start putting in lots of pressure, see how it starts spreading out and flaring? That's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to avoid. So I'm watching my thread tension back here. I'm also, when I wrap in these next two materials, I'm not wrapping at the very back. I'm wrapping a few wraps forward because there's enough uh, other wraps in place that'll help prevent me. See, I can, I can pull really hard and not flare that hair. It'll, it'll uh, protect that. So now we want to go ahead and put in uh, our body. So I'm going to just, I'll, I'll stick to the same material. I've been playing with some fun materials for this. Um, I've actually used some peacock curl and that makes a really cool stimulator. But, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do um, dubbing this time. Uh, ooh, almost made a mistake. I, I'm, I bet Jeff right now is typing up, hey, silly, don't put the dubbing on yet. I got ahead of myself. We have to put in the hackle feather. So I almost made a, 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 a rookie error there. Um, by the way, I've done this a ton. I make those errors all the time. Um, so I need another hackle feather. And again, I'm going to gauge it. Looks good. Like I said, for my stimulators, I like them to be about that hook length or hook gap. And uh, now we'll tie it in. All right, it's so the same thing. Just kind of make that comb so that this can get nice and secure. Isn't going to pull out on me. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, so Jeff, I have never really liked tying with wire. And I know a lot of people love tying with wire and they'll do a counter wrap. I am awful at it. I am, I am horrific at tying in that way. Um, by the way, I'm tying this in the exact same way at that angle that we, we've done now for our Elk Hair Caddis. Um, but I'm absolutely garbage at um, trying to tie in with um, with that wire. 
And uh, I, I'm really sorry, guys, because I know it's a good technique that a lot of people do. Um, I will practice it and I will show it to you one day. How about that? Uh, but no, I, um, I'm going to tie this the exact same way that we did a caddis. Right? So hackle first, then my dubbing, put in that dubbing noodle. See, I've got some bare thread. So I'm going to wrap around first with that thread until we get that dubbing on. And then we're going to start wrapping forward, trying to keep it relatively even, run out of dubbing. So I'm going to get more, apply more, rinse and repeat. And we're going to stop a little bit farther back than we did with the elk hair caddis. So I'm going to put another small section on and I'll show you what I mean. Stand by. So we're going to stop at about that point. So that's much farther back on the hook than the elk hair caddis. And you'll see why here in just a minute. We're gonna, when we tie in our um, hair, we're gonna tie in closer to the way that I did the first caddis, where I trim those butts first. And you'll see what we do. It's a little bit different. This is where that fly, this fly starts to distinguish itself from the, uh, the elk hair caddis. But all the steps, with the exception of that tail, has been the exact same so far. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to put in a, kind of a safety knot, a half hitch, just so I can then palmer this around. And so um, let me put in the half hitch first, and then I'm going to explain why I'm about to do something that I'm about to do. So put in that half hitch right in that position. And if I were uh, not using a rotary vise and not about to use the rotary feature, and again, I'm using the rotary feature because I'll block it with my, my hand if I don't, um, then I would go ahead and just start palmering and leave the thread right where it is. But because I'm about to use the rotary, I'm actually going to open spiral to right up to the eye of the hook. And the reason for that is the thread behaves better when you spin the hook around. Um, using the rotary feature. It kind of gets trapped and starts going really weird if you have it right up um, where that tying point is versus where it is behind the eye of the hook, it just behaves more. That's the only reason why I advanced it. Otherwise, I would leave it right where it is. Um, so I'm gonna grab my hackle pliers and I'm going to palmer or, or wrap this hackle around my hook. And I'm gonna do the same thing I just did with the elk hair. Kind of an open uh, elk hercatus, kind of that open spiral up to the front. So I can see my dubbing through it and it's not wrapped super, super uh, crazy uh, tight. Um, now, that's a little out of focus. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know how that happened. Um, I'm going to back up a turn because I went too far forward. And uh, you do not want to crowd the eye of the hook on this pattern. It's gonna be really important here in just a minute, right? So I'm going to tighten my thread up. So, go right up here and start trapping in my hackle. Like how Jeff's playing the uh, the Sony. The actual thing, Jeff, is I moved my vise, is what happened, and I pushed it out of focus. So to get it back in focus, I literally had to push the vise forward. So I'm going to go ahead and trim off my hackle. Trim down some of these longer fibers that I always trap. Nearly cut my thread twice while doing it. And... I'm going to clean this up a bit, just a couple wraps forward and back. Now I've got a natural ramp occurring here. See that? That's a good thing because this fly is a little bit different in that I'm going to purposefully tie in a ramp for, um, 
the last part of this fly, which we haven't talked about yet. We're actually gonna put another wrap of hackle in here in a minute. So I did the same thing I just did with the Alcar Caddis. Kind of put my scissors on, kind of trimmed back to give that, that cool little ramp effect. Makes it look really nice, right? Um, so this next part is the exact same as the Alcar Caddis. We're gonna take our deer here. We're going to, again, I use my bodkin. Grab a very healthy amount. I like a really healthy amount on my stimulator, so lots of hair. Uh, that's about half the length of this little patch, right? Um, and it might even be more than what I grabbed for the elk hair caddis. Um, but if you want to only put on the same amount that you've done the elk hair caddis, it's fine. I just like a, a heavy floating stimulator. Um, so lots of, lots of deer hair for our wing. All right. Collapsing that down into that bundle and start cleaning this up. And it's really, this particular, actually it's not too bad. You get some that will have lots of underfair, um, some patches of deer hair. Uh, others will be fairly clean. This one is actually one of the, the cleaner ones. It's, it's quite nice. So just take my time, get as much out as I can. And I'm gonna go ahead and stack this again by putting the tips in and again, don't have to stack it. You could totally line it up and tie it in, but just because I like it cleaner, I, I will use my hair stacker. Uh, but again, it's not a required, not a required tool. So same thing, right? I'm just, just tapping just enough, gets everything aligned, pull that out. You can see all those tips are very nicely aligned and uh, just grab them by the tips, pull out that bundle. Don't worry if a couple fall out in the process. Those just were too short or something like that. So what I'm gonna do, remember we're tying in maybe a third of the way back on this hook shank. And I'm looking for my, my um, tips to end kind of just before the tail ends. You can tie it where they're perfectly the same this is my preference. Uh, this is this is up to you, to you, but I'm going to do it at about there. And so I'm marking that with my fingers. And without moving this bundle, I am looking for that hook eye. And I'm going to trim this back. And I'm actually trimming at a slight angle. So you see how there's a ever so slight angle. That just helps me when I put this, when I tilt the wing up. So they're not, right now they're flat, now they're tilted. That puts that wing like the El Caracatus where it's sticking upright. And I'm gonna go ahead and put kind of a loose wrap in, two loose wraps. And I'm gonna pause here on three, because I want you to see how these tip, these butt ends are ending just before the eye of the hook. And notice how they're ending at different lengths. That's gonna give me that ramp. So I'm tying successfully, successively tighter as I go forward. Not a lot of pressure was applied back by my fingers. A lot more pressure is happening up by the eye of the hook. And I'm gonna come back, ah, they're coming loose. Cut them a little too short. If that happens, just kind of trap as best as you can. I'm gonna have a couple fibers that are gonna escape on me. That's all right. I'm gonna wrap back. And I'm doing looser wraps. See that? Up here by my fingers, see how I'm not pulling real tight? I'm just doing looser wraps. It's uh, What it's doing is it's creating this shape I'm gonna wrap forward so I can have nice tight pressure up there. And I know I'm gonna lose just a couple of fibers. I'm gonna kind of manipulate around and, and shape it so it looks good, mostly. Uh, I'm gonna clean this up just a bit. Gonna come back here and kind of get my thread up by where that deer hair is. There's that tuft. I knew there was a loose bundle in there because um, I missed some of it. All right, so that's about right. Now this thing right now looks a little weird, right? 
Well, that's because we're going to tie in another round of hackle up here in the front. So I've done my best not to crowd the hook eye as much as I can. And I crowd the hook eye on this all the time, but I've done all right here. And we've kind of got this, this neat little ramp in place. That's going to allow us to tie in our um, hackle feather. And we're going to tie this really close together. So we did kind of open spirals back here, up here. We're going to do them real tight. So you're going to see that. And really important when you go to do this, that you absolutely put in that, that comb, right? So we, we kind of move those little barbs out. We've made that little comb. We're going to put that in place and we're going to tie that sucker in. And make sure that's good and tight um, in place. Now I'm not putting a ton of pressure on my thread. So I'm going to go ahead and put another half hitch in. Where'd my tool go? There it is. Right up by the eye of that hook. I'm gonna put two in just in case. Go ahead and hang that, because now we're gonna go ahead and wrap this part in. So, I'm gonna save everyone a lot of headache on a stimulator because we're gonna wrap this very tightly around this front part that we've created. And then we have to secure it. And I can tell you that securing this is really hard because of the way that we've made this ramp um, by putting in half hitches and putting in uh, whip finishes and things like that. Can be done and um, you know it will work, but you will get a much nicer looking fly if you cheat and you use super glue. And I'm a big fan of cheating with super glue. So I'm going to put a real thin layer of super glue all the way around this thread on the front of the fly. And that's going to ensure that we actually capture in place this hackle feather when we, when we wrap it around. And I use this Ultra Gel Loctite because it allows me to have time without it instantly setting, right? Same stuff that we use on our bass flies. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna use my hackle pliers. This is where hackle pliers are super handy. And I am going to uh, wrap this in place. And when we do this, we are gonna to try to put these wraps as tight together as possible without going over top of the previous row. So very close together. Take your time, go slow, and you can totally get it. And because I put in that super glue, I don't necessarily have to worry about crowding the hook eye too much. I'm just let it kind of hang out right there. We're gonna give this a minute or two to dry before we trim it um, because we want to make sure that you know it's not going to go and un you know spiral back on us and I have the thread still on for a reason there's a reason why I've done this there's a method in my madness um, I could have cut that off I could have like whip finished cut it off or just put a couple of half hitches and cut it off and then when I go to trim the uh, fly here everything will be perfect but um, I'm going to throw in a couple of half hitches here in just a minute and, and clean this fly up that much more so I'm gonna blow on it slightly, uh, just to make sure that our, uh, our glue sets. And uh, the way you can tell if it's set is, you see how that, I put slack in it and it's not coming undone? So it's set. So I can come in and I can actually trim that half off and it's not gonna suddenly come and, and unspiral on me and make me use explicatives on a, on a YouTube live stream. So I'm going to use my half hitch tool and I'm going to push back and put a couple of half hitches kind of over top and back a bit. One, it is actually going to put some thread over the hackle and two, it's going to make us all not to trim anything. Keep the eye of the hook nice and clean. Um, keep the hackle nice and straight 
and we have a stimulator dry fly now finished. So yeah, there were a couple subtle differences, right? Uh, between this and an elk hair caddis, right? This whole section up here, kind of brand new. Um, obviously we did a little bit of a tail, right? We tied it on a slightly different hook, but this is my favorite dry fly, hands down. This, I'm tying, I'm putting this on with a lightning bug nymph 90, 95% of the time when I'm fishing for brook trout. I change up the coloration. I tied this one um, uh, like, like the cinnamon kind of dubbing color. I usually don't use that color. Usually I'm going for an orange, but um, thank you, Stu. I'm glad you, glad you like it. Uh, super, but you can tell like oh, we can change this color up all day. I can tie it in all black. Right, and it's meant to um, be a stone fly, but uh, honestly, I think it just really—it's a really good—it's a good mayfly. It's a good caddis imitation. It's just a really good attractor pattern. So we can tie with lots of different types of colors. You can tie, um, you know, different color tail if you want. Just why not, right? Um, I will say this. So I'm going to throw a different stimulator on. I use the same hackle feather for uh, the back and the front. But the way that I tie them for my box is a little different. I, I didn't show you that today. Uh, so let me pull up, pull up a good one that I did recently. There's one. This one was actually tied with, with elk hair. Um, it's tied a little bit differently. And actually, is that, is that one that I did different? I can't remember. Um, well, I'll explain. So one thing is that this is actually tied, it's hard to see with my lighting. Um, that is actually peacock pearl for the body as my dubbing. Um, the other thing, again, I, I tied with elk hair, is I tried to use a hackle sh that was shorter than the longer hackle in the back. So play around with that. I like to use short hackle in the front of my stimulator, longer hackle in the back. I think it makes a nicer looking stimulator. Um, but you can totally, just like we just tied, you can use the exact same length, but I still think you get a really nice looking fly. So John, I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, you get some enjoyment out of this. So. You know, that's, that's kind of all I had planned for tonight. I know we went a little bit longer than normal. Now let me switch my camera angles. Um, we can talk about the rest of this year. So, so the reality is, is that Healing Waters was hoping to be in what we call um, like a phase two reopening. Phase two is going to be where we're going to be able to fish with you again. That means that it'll be one-on-one. -on -one. We're not gonna have large groups. It'll be one volunteer with uh, one veteran. We are working on that here for the Charlottesville program for when we get to that. Unfortunately, we were not able to, um, you know, headquarters made the decision and, and one that, that I support to not announce phase two as they originally intended. Originally, they were gonna announce it for December, um, sadly. Uh, we were in a very different state than we were when they were talking about doing this back in September. And uh, for, for that reason, we um, are going to remain in kind of our, our virtual only programs. But uh, for our Charlottesville program, I am actively working on having individual guide bags. We'll give it out to our volunteers. Um, for a couple of our volunteers who have joined us tonight, you know, as always, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, we'll, we'll send out some separate communication for you guys when we get closer to a phase two. Hopefully that won't be too much longer. We don't know when it'll be. It's going to be a few months is my guess. Um, hang with it, guys. So, but, but then we'll make sure that you guys have a bag, you guys have a, a long-handled net, and uh, have plenty of flies so that you can take people out, and, and, and we'll help organize that so you guys can actually get out and get fishing. Um, that's coming. Uh, we just don't know when. We will let you know as soon as we know more around that. So the next thing is for the rest of the year. So my original plan was to only do one of these events in December. 
um, the second week of December of doing kind of a fun night. And when I say a fun night, I am not intending to tie a fly that can be fished. I actually intend to use uh, my, my deer hair, the bass bug hair, and tie up a Christmas tree. Um, I haven't tied one yet or I'd show you. But I, I kind of have a history around this time of the year of tying up goofy things. Last year I tied up um, the child from the Mandalorian, otherwise known as Baby Yoda. Uh, I tied up one of those. I've tied up a snowman. I've tied up a turkey. Um, those are, are actually on display at, uh, at Mossy Creek uh, Fly Fishing Shop. Uh, the reason why they're over there is because uh, I actually have um, Cody uh, or Col Colby. I'm really tired tonight. Sorry, Colby. Um, to thank for uh, learning how to, to do a lot with, with deer here. He actually um, spent uh, about an hour one day and, and, and showed me and, and got me started and gave me a lot of feedback. So as a thank you, I always hand them these fun things. So I don't have any actually to show you. But um, we're gonna do that. So we're gonna tie up a goofy fly, right? And, and kind of um, end 2020 in that way. I hadn't planned on doing a second meeting in December. Typically, we, we haven't. We've always only done the, the one kind of Christmas party. We're going to do a virtual Christmas party this year. If you guys really feel that you want, um, even need, a, uh, a, a second virtual tying event or whatever event in December, let me know, and we can plan it. Um, but, um, you know, I just want to let you know that I was only planning on doing one more for 2020. Um, feel free to get up on me and tell me otherwise, and, and we'll do a second one. Uh, so that's, that will finish us out for the year. Um, the, yeah, I love it. Sasquatch. So totally Stu, play around and have fun. Like I said, we're going to goof off, right? We're, we're going to show more of the artsy side. I actually got a glue gun for this Christmas tree. Um, I intend to tie up mini egg flies as ornaments. Oh, uh, I, I am going to get ridiculously goofy with this thing. And so, you know, I hope you guys join and have a lot of fun with that. Uh, the, the other thing too that I wanted to point out is that I am going to learn, this is my promise, my commitment, um, this is uh, a very early uh, New Year's resolution, if you will, to learn how to build a fly rod. And by doing that, then that is going to allow me to do a virtual rod building series. I haven't decided if they'll be live or if they're going to be pre-recorded. Um, and uh, then we are also getting kits for the, the Charlottesville participants. I know we have some people who join us from all over. Uh, talk to your local programs. See if they have a rod building kit. You can go along with us. Everyone is more than welcome. We know we have a couple people who join who aren't in Pearl Street Killing Waters. Go out and get a rod kit. Um, you know, we, there, there are a couple different companies that are out there, and you can tie along with us. Like, don't ever feel like you can't you know, join along or ask questions. Uh, but that is, that is our plan for 2021, early on, hopefully, as long as the materials come in. They haven't yet, uh, but we have a month. They have been ordered uh, to, um, to have that for you guys, and we'll figure out how to distribute them, and, and then you guys can build some rods. Um, so we had a couple questions about catching fish. So can you catch fish in the Rivanna now? Absolutely. It is going to require slow and deep. You're going to want to find the deep holes, you're going to want to fish things slow and you're going to fish on the bottom. I highly recommend something like a uh, claw dad to, to fish. Good crayfish imitation. Maybe even a critter mite, like a um, helger mite pattern. Uh, Jeff may have some other uh, recommendations as well. As Jeff has said, it is hard. Smallmouth, they, they do eat in the winter, 100%. Um, but they don't eat as much. They don't need as much. They're not burning as many calories. The other thing to be on the lookout for in the winter are hot days. If you get a series of hot days, go and check out the shallows because the smallmouth will make runs into the shallows on warmer days with the right weather conditions. And you can actually throw in like a minnow imitation and catch them. It's very rare. It's not easy. Uh, and it's a lot of luck involved in being there at the right time, but it is possible. Mossy Creek are, um, that is a consistent temperature year round. Stimulators year round. You can, you can catch fish on, at Mossy. Mossy's hard because uh, it is heavily pressured. 
Um, but I, I have gone there and I've caught fish at, at in the middle of winter in Mossy Creek uh, and dry and um, and our brook trout, right? So you know there are many different brook trout streams and they fish year round. In fact, dry flies work really well in the middle of January for brook trout. Believe it or not, uh, you catch more on nymphs, but um, they'll they'll hit dries year round. I, I love those fish. So a uh, couple couple creeks that I'll recommend. Um, I always recommend the Rapidan just because it's a heavy flow and there's lots of fish. You want to go uh, as high up as you can um, because typically, you know, the, the higher elevation you are, the more brook trout that are up there. Uh, there are a number of what we call blue streams along the Shenandoah National Park where you can catch fish. You can also go out to the George Washington National Park, catch a ton of them. Um, there are a couple out past Harrisonburg as well. Um, uh, Rapidan is really easy to, to recommend because everyone knows it. There's some others. Uh, you know, feel free to, to hit up Jeff or myself or, or even any of the local fly shops. We let you know um, if there are particular streams that seem to be fishing better than others. So I, I say though, we are now, you want to be careful. Remember we, we, we had our brook trout video. We talked about reds. We talked about not wanting to step on them. I don't go in waders right i will go up and purposely try to stay out of the water just to avoid accidentally stepping on on any of those you can you can 100 percent wear waders just be more towards the head of the stream than the tail of the stream be very mindful of where you're stepping step on big rocks if you're stepping on gravel there's a, a greater likelihood that there'll be um uh eggs in in the gravel especially in the, the tails of pools but by not wearing waders and not going in the stream, there's a 0% chance that I'm trancing on those, those eggs. That's why I do that. Um, it's my preference. So, so that's what I recommend this time of year um, is go after, go after trout or, or char if it's in the case of brook trout because technically they're not trout. They are a uh, species of char. Go after them and um, bass season will open back up in the spring. There's one more fish that you can go after in the winter time. Uh, that is musky. And by go after them, I mean you'll go out all day and you'll wear your arm out and not catch anything. But if you catch one, it'll probably make your year. Um, they are 100% safe to fish for now. We don't fish for them in the summer. We only fish for them in the cooler months because we want those water temperatures to really get below. Um, again, similar to trout, uh, mid-60s, it's becoming really dangerous for musky, so we want that cooler water for them um, so that they... Uh, have the ability of, of recovering. They get lactic acid build up in the warmer water and, and they don't have the oxygen content needed to flush it out of their system. And so they'll end up, they'll swim away just fine. But um, sadly, they have a really high mortality rate. So that's why we don't fish for them in the summer months. Um, so musky is the other thing you can go after. Uh, if you're gonna go after musky, go on, you know, James, Shenandoah. Um, <laughs> every once in a while, you'll hear about the South River, uh, which is another good spot for, for trout. Um, you'll hear about muskie in the south. That does happen occasionally. Um, but uh, if you're interested in learning about targeting muskie, let me know. And um, I can do my best to give what little information I have. I am not an expert, um, but we can do those. If you want to see another muskie fly, I know we had uh, Andy tie us one um, earlier in the year. I can, I can tie up one as well. Um, just basically let me know what you guys want, what you're looking for, especially since we're going to be doing virtual for at least probably another few months, uh, hopefully less, but um, yeah, give me that feedback. Other than that, I hope everyone's doing really well. And uh, yeah, thank you, Rick. Um, Mossy Creek Fly Fishing, they have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, they are putting out videos of their fishing reports. They also have a blog that they put out every month as well. Uh, with updates of, hey, where to fish, what the targets, so on and so forth. But they're doing weekly fishing reports right now, I believe, as well on their on their YouTube channel. It's just Mossy Creek Fly Fishing. If you look at that, you, you'll, you'll find them. Um, so uh, with that, I wish everyone the best. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, for especially our, our veterans here in Charlottesville, you know how to get in touch with me. Any questions, send it out. Um, for those of us outside of our, our Charlottesville program, uh, always thank you. Welcome. And uh, any questions you have, leave them in the comments. And other than that, I, I will wish everyone uh, a good night. And I'll talk to you, uh, I don't know, in something like two, three weeks when we, when we do the crazy holiday thing. All right, take care. Have a good night.